Okay. Uh, why don't I begin? Uh, it is 2 p.m. and people have uh, are logging in as I speak, and I'll make some introductory remarks, and then that will allow a lot of time for questions. So uh, thanks for attending this webinar. It's on a, a new report that uh, describes a new database on business incentives for economic development in the United States. Uh, this database and a report describing it are being released March 7th. Uh, so the information in this webinar and in the report and database, uh, we'd appreciate you not publicizing it until March 7th. Uh, we're doing this uh, webinar ahead of time so that people have plenty of time to try to understand this um, database, which has a lot of complexities to it. Uh, uh, that we hope people can explore. And we, I hope you've had a chance before the webinar to at least glance at the report's introduction and to at least look at the database a little bit. So um, one thing I should say as introduction as well is this, the development of this database was supported in part by Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, we appreciate their support. Um, of course, the views expressed in the report uh, and this webinar are my views. They shouldn't be interpreted as necessarily reflecting the views of the Pew Charitable Trust or the UpGen Institute. Uh, and uh, Pew's support for this, I think, is part of their broader effort to encourage states to better evaluate state economic development incentives, and uh, they have a lot of work on how to do better evaluation that's well worth reading. Um, so what I thought I'd do before answering questions is briefly go over some of the um, main findings from the database, very briefly, in just a few slides, and uh, then I can get to your questions. And the way the questions work is hopefully in the software there's a place where you can type in questions. You can type those in anytime, and I'll answer them once I get through this very brief presentation. So I said this is a new database, and uh, what's so new about it? Um, well, I think several things are new. It's, it's much more comprehensive and detailed, I think, than some previous efforts to quantify incentives. It has far more industry detail. Uh, it has specific data for 45 different industries in the U.S. that are basically over 90 percent of the U.S. labor market. It has many more years than previous efforts. Usually the previous things have done a few years. This does 26 years from 1990 to 2015. Uh, it does include 33 states, which uh, are over 90 percent of the U.S. economy. and in, uh, exp in exploring the data, we have much more detail on different types of incentives and on when incentives are provided over the life of a new facility. Uh, and this allows for much more analysis of what type of uh, industries are getting the most incentives. Are, are states targeting, for example, industries that offer higher wages or other types of p potential social benefits for state residents? And the database also can be used to analyze the effects of different possible incentive reforms. And we're making this database open access. Uh, if you've gone to the website and looked at it, you can basically download all the database or data just for a specific state or a specific type of incentive or a specific year. And uh, we're making that available for free for people to look at and use as they see fit. Uh, well, so what are the, some of the main findings from the database? Uh, well, one finding is that the incentives, at least for so-called export-based industries, are quite large. Now, um, I should explain that export-based industries is jargon in regional economics for businesses that sell their goods and services outside the state, and they're thought to be the basis of a state's economy because they bring new dollars into the state and they have uh, multiplier effects on the state economy. Um, so if we look at these export-based industries, average incentives are about a little bit less than 1.5% of business value added, which is a measure kind of a business's local cost, uh, about 6% of business profits, almost a third of state and local business taxes, and quite a bit higher in some states, and per worker job year, almost $2,500 is the average incentives. And the estimated total national cost on an annual basis is about $45 billion. So these are sizable. It's a sizable cost to state and local governments. And they're large enough that they are um, big enough share of business costs that they, they, you might potentially want to at least look at them. Um, 
another main finding is that incentives have enormously grown over the past 25 years. That uh, back in 1990, incentives were less than 10% of state and local business taxes, for example. Since then, they've roughly tripled to about 30%. Uh, a lot of that growth was in the 1990s. Since 2000, the picture is more mixed. There are, there are, there are states expanding incentives. There are some states cutting back on incentives. Um, uh, so there's a lot of things going on since 2000, but the overall trend is not as sharply up as it was in the 1990s. Another main conclusion of the database is that incentives uh, don't vary that much across different export-based industries. Um, if you look at this chart, this shows the value of incentives as a percentage of value added and it compares it with the average wages in the industry uh, for the 31 export-based industries. And most industries are between uh, 1 and 2 percent of value added, actually even narrower than that, between say 1.2, 1.3 percent of value added and maybe 1.8 percent of value added. That's a relatively narrow range and in fact, now in this chart it looks as if incentives tend to go down with higher wages if you control for other variables, it turns out they do tend to go up slightly with average wages, but uh, not by very much. So um, uh, basically, uh, incentives are not really highly targeted by industry characteristics, which is kind of unfortunate because we would expect industries, say, with higher wages to provide have greater multiplier effects and have greater social benefits, economic benefits for state workers. Another main conclusion of the database is, though incentive, incentives don't vary a lot across industries, they vary quite a bit across states and quite a bit even across nearby states. So, uh, you know, New Mexico, for example, has four times the incentives of Arizona. New York has uh, five times the incentives of Connecticut. Uh, Louisiana over two and a half times the incentives of Texas, Indiana twice the incentives of Illinois, South Carolina uh, over twice the incentives of North Carolina, and you can go on. There are many cases where nearby states have quite different incentives. Um, and when you actually look at it in more detail, it's very hard to figure out why one state has incentives and another state doesn't. It's not due to a state having higher unemployment, for example, um, not really correlated with that. The biggest predictor of whether a state has more incentives is what it had last year. So it seems to be the incentives that seem to be largely driven by idiosyncratic uh, political factors. And the other thing is when you analyze it, if you think about it, um, there's no obvious sign that New York is the miracle state while Connecticut is a basket state and New no sign that New Mexico is a miracle state while Arizona is a basket state despite the fact there are these very large variation incentives and we do a more detailed analysis we don't really find that incentives um, uh, really even at the industry level seem to have dramatically large effects on state economic growth or industry specific economic growth. So the incentives provided in a particular state and year or a particular industry uh, don't seem to uh, show a very large effect on the industry activity. It's actually towards the low end of what the research leaders su suggest on how sensitive businesses would be to incentives. So that's just a very brief presentation. The main purpose of this is to answer various questions people might have. So what I'm hoping you're, that people are doing is typing in various questions. If your question doesn't get answered during this webinar, which will go to about three, uh, you can email me or call me. I've stuck in my office phone number and my cell phone number and I will try to answer your question. Uh, either before before March 7th, um, uh, which is the public release date, and obviously you can also call me after that and I'll try to answer questions. So let me open up the floor to questions. Please type them in and then they will be forwarded, in, um, uh, forwarded to me by the staff here. Okay, first question, and here I, hopefully you can all see the question. Uh, what was the most surprising finding to you from these data? The most surprising finding to me was actually how little incentives varied 
across industries, and in particular how little they vary with wages, jobs, and R&D spending of the industry. And the reason that surprised me is I already knew just from you know anecdotal evidence and from just being familiar with incentives that there'd been a big increase. Um, there had been some increase in job creation tax credits across the states over the last 25 years. I knew there had been some increase in research and development credits. And with job creation tax credits, a lot of states have rhetoric about um, targeting high wage firms. And in fact, there are provisions in some of these credits that target high wage firms. And I guess going into this project, I expected that those rules that these job creation tax credits and these rules about higher wage firms um, would cause incentives to be highly correlated with an industry's wages. And they aren't. There are some effective wages on um, uh, how much incentives are provided, but it's not that large. It's certainly not large enough to correspond to um, uh, uh, the social ben the greater social benefits of higher wages, um, and uh, similarly with R&D, I thought R&D would play a much more major role. It looks as if basically states, in practice, have mostly handed out the same incentives to everyone, which presumably reflects some political dynamics of how incentives operate. Okay, we have another question from Kenneth Thomas. Uh, who's done a lot of great work on incentives. I commend his work on comparing U.S. and, uh, uh, and European Union incentives. How do you get to $45 billion on value-added data? Well, that's described in detail in the report. Basically, uh, what I do is take these different incentive estimates that I have for these different states, and uh, I calculate uh, with an assumption about what the age distribution of firms are, what that implies in terms of the total dollar value of incentives in the in the country. So it's basically um, uh, a calculation of uh, uh, what the incentives would be based on given age distribution of firms. And I also compare that with more direct estimates of what incentives are from looking at state tax expenditure reports. And um, you come up with something that's pretty highly correlated. The number from tax expenditure reports is not as high, but I think that's because it doesn't include various, various incentives. There are a lot of gaps in tax expenditure reports. So I regard the $45 billion as a more accurate estimate of uh, the total volume of incentives than what you get from directly looking at tax expenditure reports. Another question: Can you give a very uh, is is being asked? Can you give a very brief explanation of what you mean by value added and how you calculate that? Well, value added is a, a standard economic concept. It it can be either defined as the uh, your sales minus your materials costs for any company. It's what the company is adding in value to the materials it buys. That's that's the reason for the terminology. It represents what is the production by that company as composed to that's adding on in value to the materials it buys. It can also be similarly defined as the sum of all the payments made to labor by the company plus all the payments made to capital by the com uh, capital inputs by the company. So uh, all the wages and benefits paid to workers and all the payments to capital, which would include interest payments on loans, it would include profits, um, so any capital payments would be also uh, sum of capital payments plus labor payments is value added. It's a very standard measure that is used in describing how big an industry is. If you want to describe how big an industry is, what you want to say is what does the industry add in value to the materials it buys and in terms of final sales. So that's the explanation of what uh, value added is. Other questions. Uh, which industries, another question that's being asked is, uh, let me make sure I display this. Which industries tend to be the most heavily subsidized? Well, 
export-based industries are more heavily subsidized than non-export-based industries. So states uh, frequently in state law only restrict incentives to export-based industries, and that seems to actually work in terms of targeted incentives. The incentives also tend to be somewhat higher for manufacturing industries. A number of states have certain incentives that are limited to manufacturing industries. However, once you get beyond that, Incentives do not vary greatly within manufacturing. As I mentioned before, it's surprising how little incentives vary with, say, wages. So, for example, if wages are higher by 10%, incentives tend to be higher by 3%. And that doesn't make really much sense because when incentives are higher by uh, when wages are higher by 10%, we would think that the social benefits of that industry for a state economy would be much higher, that would go up by much more than 10%. So from a benefit-cost standpoint, um, we're not targeting these incentives nearly enough. Other questions? Okay, the database. Uh, what database is it? What detail is offered? It's basically at it roughly what uh, in would be called a uh, three-digit NAICS level, though it, it varies. It, I basically start out with some industry categories provided by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and then I matched up some data by the IRS to add in some other variables. Um, how was the database constructed? Well, the database was constructed over three years. Uh, what I first did is collect a lot of data on what were the incentive rules and tax rules in different states in different years. So how did I collect that? I went to a wide variety of websites, state economic development agency websites, local economic development agency websites. Uh, I used some resources from the advocacy group Good Jobs First, um, also from the group C Tour. They provided some description of incentives. I looked at state revenue department websites, which a lot of times have rules for how incentives are calculated, how they're taken. Also have some tax rules, so some of the detail you can only get from actually looking at the websites. I actually read a bunch of state statutes and looked at what the actual wording of the state law said. I looked at many different analyses of economic development reports that various outside watchdog groups, legislative audit bureaus have done of different states that describe the incentive rules. I got some data from, uh, I don't know if he's on the broadcast, but Michael Mazaroff of Center for Budget and Policy Priorities uh, uh, let me look, um, gets access to some of his data on how states, um, some of the corporate income tax rules of different states. Um, there were many people who provided data, David Merriman, uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and then I had to take these rules and we combine this with balance sheet information on, for a given industry, um, what are the, you know, how much in property does it have versus workers, how much, what are, you know, what are the wages, what are, what are these various ratios of these different balance sheet items, and I basically calculate what the incentives and taxes would be over a 20-year period after a new facility started up. And that, um, anyway, the report goes into a lot more detail, maybe more detail than people want, that describes, uh, I should say that what incentives are included, since that was also asked, the incentives that are included include property tax abatements, customized training subsidies, job creation tax credits, investment tax credits, and research and development tax credits. And I think by doing that, we've calculated the major types of incentives. Okay, next question. Uh... From Michael Mazaroff. Um... People on the right often argue that states enact incentives to counteract high effective tax rates exclusively incentives. The bordering state periods you just presented seem to contradict that. Is that a broader finding of the paper? Brief answer is yes. Uh, there are some cases where incentives may be high in part because of high business tax rates. So I think part of the reason why New Mexico has high incentives, it does have relatively high business tax rates. Uh, but in general, we don't find that uh, in, when business taxes are higher, 
and uh, mechanically at least incentives don't tend to go up that much and they go up some but uh, in fact I think incentives are high or low largely due to idiosyncratic political features of a state some governor came into power some state legislative majority came into power they decide they want to do something bold to improve the state economy they came up with some idea for an incentive package that uh, rewards certain types of investment or certain types of job creation R&D and they pass it and once these incentives are passed they tend to be fairly persistent over time so I really do think it is that incentives are largely driven by idiosyncratic political factors not by simply offsetting high business taxes um, and in fact if you look at the general thing as incentives have tripled over the past 25 years gross business taxes before incentives have actually declined slightly so um, you know it's not the case that incentives have tripled because business tax rates have gone up that's not what's going on um, other questions let me see if to make sure I'm getting um, okay question being asked about Texas does this indicate a state like Texas shouldn't uh, spend money on incentives according to the report its incentives are 13 percent below the average but has a good economy well what I you know generally what I think should be going on with incentives is that states should be targeting them much more and cutting costs by um, restricting incentives to cases where incentives have a relatively high bang for the buck now what kind of incentives have a high bang for the buck as mentioned in the report there's some evidence that some of these services to small and medium-sized businesses such as customized job training has a relatively high bang for the buck in addition if you're going to have cash incentives tax incentives other cash incentives uh, if you target industries that have um, high wages high re research and development spending and do not provide incentives to low-wage industries um, that don't have any R&D spending then you're going to have a lot lower cost incentives and you're still target some of the businesses that have higher incentives in addition a lot of states have incentives that are way too uh, long-lived by which I mean the property tax abatement you provide in year 11 um, given how heavily business decision makers discount the future it's highly unlikely that a property tax abatement in year 11 really does anything at all to incentivize business investment, business location decisions. So, um, I really don't think um, states should be uh, should probably have more incentives up front, and that would lower costs quite a bit. They, you know, they should have clawbacks, but um, these long-term incentives just give away a future governor or future mayor's tax base and don't do much to really drive economic development. Um, another question. Uh, how should the database be used by different analysts academic economic development practitioner fiscal analyst well I you know I think there are a lot of different uses for this I think uh, one thing people can do is simply uh, if you are a practitioner you might want to see uh, how your your state's incentives have changed over time and why and why your incentives differ from nearby states and how much they differ and why they differ and if you want to do that you can go to the database and you can download um, your incentives and different types of incentives and different types of taxes over the last 26 years for your state and you can figure out what's changed over time in your state and why or you can look at nearby states and see what's you know why your you know how your state differs in both in overall incentives and different types of incentives for a fiscal analyst I think you also could do that you could look at look at the same kind of things of which incentives are the most costly for the state uh, that can be analyzed using this database which incentives cost the most um, for an academic analysis I think you might want to download if I were an academic I'd want to download the whole database and start crunching numbers on it uh, by giving away this database I'm doing something that's a little bit unusual in the sense that a lot of times researchers keep the data until they've kind of mined it uh, and exhausted all the interesting findings I have not done that I've done this report I've done some preliminary analysis as far as I'm concerned any assistant professor uh, or grad student you know since a professor wants to get tenure or uh, just interested in doing good research or a grad student looking for a dissertation topic feel free to download the data and try to figure out what determines these incentives uh, what effects they have uh, I'd be happy to answer questions about it so I think this can be but if I were a researcher I want to download the whole thing 
uh, right away. And uh, um, so feel free to do that and feel free to analyze it. And uh, as long as you just cite the source of the data, I'm happy. So other questions? Okay, I can just start talking. Ah, question is: Did your research reveal anything about the efficacy or cost effectiveness of tradable or refundable tax incentives? Well, I don't know if we, I have not separately analyzed the effectiveness of those incentives, and that would actually be something to look at. Is there any sign that's, that states that have refundable incentives have any different outcomes than states that don't? Um, and that could be done with this database. I have not done that. Uh, what I have looked at um, is whether or not refundable tax incentives make a difference, and they do. Uh, if you eliminate refundable incentives, I actually don't remember off the top of my head the exact number. I do know that we did some simulations in the report, and um, if you eliminate refundability of taxes, okay, so I, I guess I say what refundability is for people who don't know. Uh, traditionally, incentives would be have been limited to the what the business paid in taxes, say the property taxes it paid, or the corporate income taxes it paid to the state treasury. And in uh, more recent years, many states, some states, have made incentives refundable. That is, they can be paid out as cash payments to the firm, even if it has zero corporate income tax liability. Um, that makes a difference. Now, I should also say that a lot of states have done what I consider a kind of disguised form of refundability. One of the things that's really driven the increase in incentives has been the number of incentives, particularly job creation tax credits, that uh, that firms can take once they've exhausted their corporate income tax liability, they can take them against the payroll tax withholdings they ordinarily would make for their workers' uh, income tax liabilities in that state. Now, the thing is about payroll withholdings, they're not really um, tax payments of the business. They're really tax payments that the business is making on behalf of its workers. And uh, I really think that one of the things that triggered the big increase in incentives in the 1990s was that a number of states, and I think this started with Kentucky, figured out that they could um, enormously increase incentives if in addition to refunding them against corporate income tax liabilities, they could allow them to be funded against payroll tax liabilities. Payroll tax liability, of course, if the state income tax is 4 or 5% of income, they're basically 4 or 5% of wages. So we're talking potentially about a 4 or 5% wage subsidy, which is huge. So um, these are very costly. Making incentives, once you say that incentives can go beyond what the business owes and tax liabilities, kind of the sky's the limit, and it becomes quite difficult for states to um, uh, say no. And um, so I do think there are some problems in making incentives refundable, or for that matter, make incentives to allowing them to be taken against um, payroll tax withholding. And on the whole, I think that in the political economy of incentives, we could restrain incentives a lot more effectively if they could only be taken against uh, property tax uh, payments or corporate income uh, tax payments or whatever the main business tax is in the state. Other question. Um, can you talk a little more about Newark causing the bump in 2000. Well, if you've looked at the report, one of the interesting things is that uh, from I, th I think from the year 2000 to 2001, um, there's a very large increase in incentives overall. And when you actually decompose that, it's all due to New York State. And the reason why it makes a difference in this, New York State's a large state, and in that year, the, a program they had at that point called Empire Zones, which was a very generous incentive program, uh, went statewide. And, um, and that program since then has been uh, eliminated and they replaced it with another program, which led to some cutbacks. Uh, and it actually does make a difference, look at national trends, whether or not you include or don't include New York. That, 
when you exclude New York for the analyses, uh, although it's true that incentives grew a lot in the 1990s and the growth has slowed down since 2000 um, or since 2001, the trends are not as stark uh, before and after 2000 because it's confused by the fact that New York State, after having incentives that were so large that for many businesses they had negative tax rates, um, New York cut that back somewhat, though it's still a very high incentive state. Uh, so you do need to, there is an analysis in the paper that looks at the trends separately for every state, and you can kind of see what states went up and what states went down. Okay, um, another question. Um, for incentives business taxes, how much do taxes fall as opposed to incentives increasing? Um, I, I assume that the question is, uh, from Kenneth Thomas, is, is about the overall time trend. And uh, most of the decrease in net taxes over the past 25 years is due to incentives growing, not due to gross taxes decreasing. So incentives are a big part of the picture as to why net state and local business taxes have trended down over time. There has been some decline in gross business taxes uh, over the past 26 years, but it's not as extensive as the increase in incentives. So um, if you want to understand what's going on in state and local um, treatment of business under under uh, and what businesses are paying and what they're receiving, you have to include incentives. So it indicates that in terms of studying uh, state and local economic development, you really do need to include incentives to get a full picture of what's going on. Okay, what type of uh, this? Let me make sure I. What type of incentive typically results in the most or least bang for the buck? Well, I would say, as I said, I think the evidence supports the notion that services to small and medium-sized businesses have the most bang for the buck. And so there are a number of good studies of, say, customized job training to indicate a large effect. Harold Holzer has done such studies. Uh, my my um, former colleague, uh, now retired, Kevin Hollenbeck of the Upjohn Institute has done good studies of customized job training. And, uh, and also there have been some studies um, <clears throat> by the folks at the University of Kentucky of customized job training. Customized job training, it looks as if it has effects that might be as large as, you know, 10 times the effect of regular cash incentives. Um, and I think, you know, the same finding is true for things like entrepreneurial training, uh, manufacturing extension services. So in a lot of my work over the years, I've promoted some of these services to small and medium-sized businesses. Why do they have a higher bang for the buck? One, it's easier to affect small and medium-sized businesses. Two, a lot of these services are things that these businesses have trouble accessing otherwise. What has the least bang for the buck? I think just cutting uh, an incentive that just provides an across-the-board um, uh, uh, tax break for 20 years that's uniform over that 20 years, I think the least bang for the buck is the incentive you're providing years 11 through 20 of the new facilities operation. They really don't drive location expansion decisions very much, and yet it basically um, undermines the tax base for your successor. Okay, another question. Uh, do I understand correctly that TIF, that is tax increment financing, is not included? If so, are any other major incentives excluded? Um, Tax increment financing incentives are not included. Uh, I would like to have included them, but there are several reasons I didn't. A tax increment financing is a type of incentive where essentially within um, some designated spatial area of a city, uh, you know, it might be a downtown area, it might be some broader area, it might be an industrial area, um, the incremental tax revenues, typically in the property tax, but sometimes in other taxes, rather than going to um, the general, going to various units of general local government or school districts or whatever, instead go to the TIF district. And these are used to support a variety of things. A lot of times they're used to finance infrastructure and they might be used to uh, pay off bonds on new infrastructure constructed in the TIF district. Now, why don't I include TIFs? For several reasons. One, there really isn't good data in a lot of states on, on TIFs. I mean, I, I really tried very hard to see what data I could get. I really felt in the end I could not get uniform data across the states on TIFs. That was one reason for excluding them. Secondly, the question is whether a lot of TIFs are, in fact, economic development centers. And the reason I say that 
if a TIF is simply a uh, applies to a narrowly defined neighborhood, it's not part of the usual deal that I, I was trying to capture the usual incentive deal that a typical firm would get if it wanted to locate in the state. And if TIFs are limited to relatively few areas, that would not be the usual deal. And particularly if TIFs are limited to areas that have substantial economic disadvantages. Um, for example, TIFs in downtown areas frequently might be largely designed to help downtown shopping areas. And that's not really an economic development function. It's really redistributing economic activity from the suburbs to the downtown. The other thing, in many cases, TIFs are supporting things that would have occurred anyway. They're not going to the firm so much. It's providing infrastructure that would have been financed in some other way anyway. Um, so those are a variety of reasons. Um, TIFs are important, and I think uh, it would be nice to include it. The, the, the study also does not include film incentives, so I, I did not include the film industry. There, there are some good studies of that that have been done recently. Um, it also doesn't include um, enterprise zone incentives or brownfield incentives. For similar reasons to TIFs, Frequently, I didn't include enterprise or brownfields unless most industrial sites in a particular city would have been eligible for the incentive. And again, the reason was if it's only a few sites, it's not part of the typical deal that most companies would get, which is what I'm trying to capture in this study. So at some point to make a project like this practical, you have to make some limitations, and those are some of the limitations that I just accepted as part of uh, making this project feasible. Did any states buck the larger trend and target incentives in a way that was particularly effective? You know, I don't really see any state that is really totally breaking the trend in all the respects that I would like to see. There are states, for example, that, that well, for example, California, Maryland, and Massachusetts all have relatively modest incentives overall, and they are much more targeted on high-tech businesses. And uh, on the whole, I think that's a um, good idea. Other features of their incentive program, however, may not be desirable. Um, some states do a lot more in customized job training. Uh, for example, my, my own state of Michigan does more in customized job training. Uh, Missouri does more in customized job training. Um, I think that's a high bang for the buck incentive, and uh, again, I would encourage other states to copy that. Uh, some states do more to target high wage industries. Uh, I have a list in the report of states that do more to target high wage industries. I'm just trying to glance at my little cheat sheet to see who some of those uh, firms were, but. Um, um, North Carolina, Oregon, and the state of Washington all tend to target high-wage industries more, uh, and so that's good. Also, there's a whole issue of front-loading. Uh, Oregon does a lot of front-loading, um, and uh, I think incentives should be front-loaded. Uh, as a general practice, I think it's bad to give away your the next governor's or next mayor's tax base um, for political economy reasons, and then it also is not as effective in driving economic development as providing incentives more up front with, 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 of course, the caveat, with, of course, clawbacks if the company leaves in too short a time period. Um, okay, another question. Do I have an estimate of the respective shares of that $45 billion coming from local and state governments? Uh, no. Uh, I do have estimates of the share of that $45 billion that comes from different types of incentives. And as a general rule, the main incentive that most local governments are providing, the most expensive one, is property tax abatements. And so I do have estimates of that. Property tax abatements are uh, the second leading incentive. The leading incentive is job creation tax credits, almost all of which is provided by uh, state government. Um, so um, the basic answer is more incentives are provided by state government, and that seems to be growing over time, because if you go back to 1990, property tax abatements were the biggest incentive, and job creation tax credits were practically non-existent. Since 1990, job creation tax credits have constituted two-thirds of the increase in incentives. Most of that comes from state government. So the trend has been towards more incentives from the state, although property tax abatements have also gone up over time.
Um, is there any evidence for your analysis that incentives are backward-looking, that is propping up declining industries, or are they forward-looking, that is incentivizing more technologically advanced industries? Basically, they're not targeting <laughs> anyone at all, is what I'm saying, that they're both propping up declining industries, and they're helping forward-looking industries, and they're uh, helping technologically backward industries, and they're helping technologically advanced industries. Uh, so there's not enough targeting going on. Uh, and I think, you know, you, I, my explanation of why that happens is that politically it's very difficult for states to target. Uh, politically, I think there's some tendency to say, um, I'm giving this deal to some companies, I want to give the same deal to everyone, and uh, there's a lot of lobbying to kind of spread the benefits out. Um, uh, and I think, you, you know, there's an old joke in, in economic development circles that refers to an old potato chip ad that when it, uh, when it comes to economic development centers, you can't give out just one. If you give out one to one company that you're trying to target, you, politically you have to kind of give it out to everyone. And then pretty soon you don't have incentives that are targeted in any particular way. So I think states are going to have to be much political. If they really want to target, are going to have to figure out mechanisms. First of all, we're going to have to identify this as a problem. We're going to have to work with state legislators and others to make them understand why just handing out and sending this randomly to everyone is not a great idea. And then we're going to have to um, see if we can overcome the political forces that might tend to uh, lead to handing out incentives to everyone. I do think perhaps there's some tendency to hand out incentives to your leading states. So I, you know, I think part of, for example, why does California and say Massachusetts target are in high R&D industries more than the average state. It may be because they have more high-tech high tech industries lobbying for this in that state, to be quite honest. Other questions? Could you summarize any highlights about city-level findings? Well, I have not analyzed the city-level results uh, so far. Uh, that's to be done. Uh, it was quite enough to analyze the state level results. I do hope at some point to analyze the city level results. There are quite a few variations across cities in the same state in um, particularly the rules for property tax abatements. Um, whoops, I don't think I've displayed this question. Let me make sure I send it. Um, uh, you know, example in Texas, there are property tax abatements, and say Dallas and Houston have quite different rules for these property tax abatements uh, in terms of their magnitude. And you see that within Michigan. Michigan's a big property tax abatement state. Uh, Detroit and Kalamazoo have quite different rules uh, for property tax abatements. So I do think at, at some point I do want to do some analysis at the city level, and that would be one of the subsequent um, uh, reports that I would hope to do with this database. Other questions? What prompted me to take a look at the incentive issue now? Well, I've been looking at incentive issue for, uh, really, um, I started looking at economic bill incentives uh, back in the uh, mid-1980s, so uh, uh, I guess I've been looking at it uh, for uh, 40 years. So, um, so what prompted me to do this report right now? Well, one of the things I've seen I've been very frustrated about it over the years is the lack of data. I mean, the Census Bureau doesn't collect data on this. There's no federal government collecting data on this. We know incentives are important, yet, you know, they've rarely been, they, you know, there have been some very good reports that have quantified incentives to some extent. You know, uh, the Upjohn Institute, my employer, we sponsored two books by Peter Fisher and Alan Peters over the years on incentives, but that was in the 1990s. Leslie Pappy at Michigan State's done some nice work over the years in the past, back in the 1980s. Um, you know, Kenneth Thomas, who I mentioned, has done some very good work comparing the U.S. and the European Union. But there just hasn't been enough uh, work that looks at um, really tried to quantify. And of course, Good Jobs First has done a good job mon you know, uh, reporting incentives. The C Tour Group has done a good job providing some uh, uh, guides to what types of incentives um, different states offer. But what they haven't really done is enough is really quantified um, exactly how much an incentive is provided for different industries in different years. 
which is what you need to really do an in-depth analysis, economic analysis of what effects these things have. And so I, I tried to fill the gap in it. And uh, after doing that, you understand why other people have not done this since it took three years. Um, so uh, there's a good reason why people have not done this effort before. It, it takes quite a bit of research effort. It wasn't just me, but many other people at the Upton Institute and required a lot of cooperation by different outside people as well. For, are there any incentives with high bang for the buck for medium and medium and large business study and report? Well, I have not actually estimated, I mean, at some point it would be nice to actually uh, estimate the models looking at different types of incentives. I would tend to think that incentives that target high wage industries as well as targeting high R&D industries would tend to have a higher bang for the buck, not necessarily because they affect business location and expansion decision to a greater extent, but because the social benefits of a high wage and, or a high tech business are probably greater, among other things, because such a business would have higher multiplier effects. With higher wages, we would expect that um, the workers are going to spend more in the local economy. That produces greater job creation benefits in the local economy. Uh, there's also some evidence that high tech businesses have higher multipliers. Enrico Moretti at the University of California, Berkeley, has some very intriguing research showing that, um, well, showing or at least suggesting, estimating that high tech industries may have multipliers as great as six. That is, for each job that you create in a high tech business, you get five spin-off jobs. That's way too high to be explained simply by spending. It must reflect some of the Silicon Valley phenomena, what economists call agglomeration economies, that high-tech industries, if you're able to foster an environment where some high-tech businesses can thrive, that attracts many more high-tech businesses who want to steal ideas and steal workers from the other high-tech businesses, which is what you see in Silicon Valley. And um, you know, so I think that those incentives may have higher multipliers simply because they have higher benefits, simply higher bang for the bucket, simply higher multiplier effects. I also think that more front-loaded incentives have higher uh, effects because we know that business decision makers are relatively myopic in their business decisions. They look mostly at what happens in the first few years. So I prefer incentives that are up front with um, some really well-enforced clawbacks. Um, Okay. Do individual incentives hurt or help or hurt the U.S. economy overall? In other words, is the competition between states a zero-sum game? Well, I don't specifically study that in this report, but I think previous research has suggested that the competition is partially but not completely a zero-sum game. And let me explain that. First of all, I think there's some evidence that, you know, the existence of these higher incentives overall that um, of the five, you know, of every five jobs created in a state by incentives, uh, perhaps four of those jobs would otherwise been created somewhere else in the U.S. One job might actually be new to the U.S. So they're, in that sense, 80% of zero-sum gain, 20% not, or maybe we're, they're, they're a 20% gain. Uh, the other thing to look at is even if they redistribute jobs. Do they redistribute jobs towards high unemployment states? The answer in this particular report is no, they don't. Uh, unfortunately, incentives are not targeted simply at high unemployment states. Once a state adopts incentives, maybe during a recession, do they, um, uh, you know, do they, uh, once the recession is over, they keep the incentives. So, uh, and then a lot of states don't do a very good job targeting high unemployment areas. There's some tendency for even if you have an enterprise zone to spread it out everywhere. So I don't think that um, uh, it is, it, there is a lot of zero-sum game aspect to it. I think potentially it could be a non-zero-sum game, particularly if we count on more positive sum game incentives. For example, I think customized job training by raising the productivity of U.S. businesses uh, could be a positive sum game even if all states invest in it. If we invest, if we encourage more research and development, that could be a positive sum game for the whole U.S. economy even if all states are competing in doing that. So I prefer that if states competed in offering more um, positive sum game incentives such as perhaps customized job training and perhaps in some cases highly targeted R&D incentives.
okay, what state's doing the best job on incentives? I kind of answered that a little bit already. I don't really think there's one state that is doing the best job. Uh, I think that, um, the, uh, that, as I said, no state has the whole package together. Some states have higher R&D incentives. Some states have more front-loaded incentives. Some states have more customized job training. Um, some states target high-wage industries. I don't see any one state that's doing all those things. Uh, so I think we need to improve awareness, have more transparency in what incentives are. We, uh, hopefully the, the Government Accounting Standard Board starting this year has required uh, disclosure of incentives. That will help. Hopefully this database will also help. Um, I think the efforts that Pew is uh, encouraging for states to better evaluate their incentives will help. Uh, so I think we have a long way to go to improve incentives. We're, we're devoting a lot of resources to this, $45 billion a year, and um, I don't think uh, we're getting enough bang for the buck from it. We could get a lot higher bang for the buck. We could get, we could get more bang at a uh, lower buck, uh, actually, is what I would say. Should the federal government seek to abolish incentives? Well, the answer is no, but um, I think the federal government could seek to reform incentives. I, I think the things like the Government Accounting Standard Board efforts to require governments to disclose incentives, transparency is good. There should be more transparency in what incentives are. I think the federal government could do more to encourage evaluation of incentives. Um, you know, it would be helpful if Pew's efforts were, were, were furthered by some grants from uh, the U.S. Economic Development Administration that would really push some rigorous evaluation of incentives. And, um, and in fact, you know, if the federal government could do something what the European Union does, I think that would be great. The European Union, um, uh, for those who don't know, and Kenneth Thomas discussed this in his books, and it's also discussed in a book that Ian Markison uh, edited for the UpJet Institute, um, <clears throat> the European Union, most of what we do in incentives in the U.S. will be illegal in the European Union, be considered illegal export subsidies. And um, those export subsidies uh, can only be allowed in the European Union under special circumstances. So, for example, uh, the European Union does have exceptions to their general rules about incentives that uh, if the incentives are for high-tech businesses or for small business or their job training incentives or they're for regions designated as economically distressed, then the rules are relaxed, and, and France or Germany can do more with incentives in those cases. But otherwise, um, they can't do as much incentives. I think a rule like that would make sense. Um, I don't know whether or not there's any real prospect of the federal government doing anything like that. So in some sense, it's a kind of a theoretical argument. I think it's very unlikely that the federal government will ever seek to abolish state and local incentives, at least under current. But who knows? The political realities can change. Other questions? Okay, are states doing enough to attract high-tech businesses? No. Uh, the evidence suggests on average that for every extra dollar of research and development spending, incentives only go up by a penny. So, uh, you know, if you think that R&D spending has substantial spillover effects in the, local in the local economy, which I think there's a lot of evidence for, I've already mentioned Enrico Moretti's work, and there's other work looking at patent spillovers, that kind of thing. Uh, that doesn't make sense. We really, you know, we, we simply, there's a, lot, there's a lot of R&D tax credits. In a lot of cases, they're relatively modest in size and simply don't really, you know. So, now, again, I'm, as I mentioned, a few states do more that uh, Maryland, Massachusetts, and California tend to have more modest incentives that are more targeted in high tech, uh, but that's not the norm among the states. Other questions? Okay, so states aren't, and so I'm saying that states aren't doing enough to target high wage jobs using incentives, but aren't, isn't any job preferable to no job? Well, okay, that's kind of a question begging, uh, you know, I guess, but uh, sure, any job is preferable to no job. Uh, the thing to recognize is that high wage jobs have some, a lot of benefits that may not be immediately apparent, and 
the benefits of just any job are more limited than might be apparent. So let's we go first to the latter question. Why is the benefit of any job more limited than might be apparent? Well, there are a lot of studies showing that if you create more jobs in the local economy, in the long run, only about 20% of those new jobs actually go to local residents. The other 80% increase in migrants. And so only 20% of new jobs actually drive up the local employment population ratio. The other 80% ends up simply attracting in migrants, which, you know, and in migrants have costs, they, um, and uh, in general, that doesn't necessarily drive up per capita earnings. So the model that some people have in their head that for every job you create, one more unemployed local resident gets a job is not true. Basically, for every five jobs you create, one more local non-employed resident gets a job. So the bang for the buck in terms of affecting employment population ratios for just any job is a little less than you might think. As for high-wage jobs, they have a lot of spillovers. Uh, a high-wage job, one will have greater multiplier effects because um, we would expect those workers to, you know, go out to restaurants more, buy stuff more at local stores. It's going to really boost the local retail sector quite a bit more. Um, and then the, uh, in the case, in addition to high-wage jobs, uh, may have effects on wage norms, that there's some evidence that high-wage jobs, if some firms come in offering high wages, it tends to drive up overall wages in the area. Did you include any federal incentives for economic development, i.e. CDFI or tax grants? No. That's a quick one. This is looking at state and local incentives and um, not at federal incentives. There are a number of federal incentives that could be included. I was interested in how incentives varied across different areas. It would be interesting to look at federal incentives uh, and see how they uh, vary as well. Why do incentives tend to be lower in the western region? Actually, one of the things you find, incentives are not that different between the northeast, the midwest, and the south. They do tend to be lower in the west, and, and that's an interesting question. Why? Why do they tend to be lower in the west? I would assume it's because the western states, particularly the coastal states of Washington, Oregon, and uh, California, uh, are states that historically have had as much growth as they want to handle, and they also are ultimately politically liberal states. And so you get that combination that they're not inclined necessarily to give out a lot of business unless they have to, and they haven't had to. Um, so that might be changing over time. Um, you know, California, it's not really incorporated in this database, but California adopted a new incentive program, California Competes, that really goes into high gear uh, in 2016, 2017, starting in those years. And uh, that incentive program will be interesting to look at to see how big it actually gets. So the politics might be changed a little bit, and so it could be that uh, things will change. I mean, we have seen a number of dramatic changes in recent years. So, for example, Tennessee, Minnesota, and Wisconsin traditionally were low incentive states. And in the past 10 years, they've all of a sudden become much higher incentive states. They're not, uh, and so, um, uh, uh, so things can dramatically change due to changing politics in a short period of time. Any, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I described incentives that generally persisting over time. In Michigan, the state significantly scaled back incentives for 2011, and lawmakers are beginning to push for new ones, citing a need to compete against other states for large projects. What is your perspective on ministers' attitude towards tax incentives over time? Yes, and in fact, you know, the big examples of states cutting back incentives in recent years are uh, Michigan in 2011 um, and New York State in the last few years and also the state of Missouri, uh, which, which replaced a very expensive job creation tax credit with a less expensive one. And in Michigan's case, they got rid of a very expensive job creation tax credit called MEGA and uh, replaced it with a less expensive one. And at the same time they did that, they cut uh, gross business tax rates quite a bit. Um, what's my perspective on that? I think that the MEGA tax credit is one of those incentives that was way too long term. It, it was up to 15 years, and in fact, uh, 
states, uh, the state of Michigan, even though the mega tax credit is uh, no longer exists anymore, the state is still paying out very large sums of money under mega, and uh, in some years it's going to result in net negative business tax um, uh, revenue because uh, mega is one of those incentives that's credited against uh, payroll tax withholding, so it can exceed this the, the a company's state corporate income tax liability. It's also mega is often is also applied to job retention, not just job creation. So there were a lot of job retention efforts that received sizable mega credits. Um, I think you know in general, um, I think the state of Michigan should have cut back on its incentives and should have made them more short-term oriented, which they did. I don't think they needed at the same time to cut uh, gross business tax rates as much as the state did. So um, in general, um, and in fact, I've done some, if, if you look at my blog, and which is called Investing in Kids, but it includes some analysis of business location, I have a whole discussion on that blog of why cutting business taxes across the board is not an effective strategy for promoting a state economy. Um, in some sense, it's even less targeted than incentives are, and so I don't think it's a great idea. So, okay, let me, um, it's now 3 o'clock, people have other things to do, I'm sure, and uh, let me, uh, um, uh, move back to, uh, I want to make sure I, people can can people see the slide right now? Okay, so my contact information hopefully is on here again. So I want to make sure people have that. Uh, it's also all over the Institute Upjohn Institute website. So if you have other questions about this database, um, email me at bardic at upjohn .org. You can call my office 269-385-0433. If I don't respond, you can call my cell phone 269-806-1904. And I'll be happy to try to answer questions. I know people may be doing stories or uh, they want to understand the database more before March 7th. So I'll especially be trying to respond in a prompt way um, before March 7th. And of course, I'll answer questions uh, afterwards. As you work with the database and try to analyze it and understand the report, read through the appendices, uh, I'll be happy to answer any further questions people have. So. Thank you very much for attending this webinar, and um, uh, we're going to post this webinar. Uh, I don't know when we're going to post it, maybe in a few days. A few days, we'll have it up there. We'll have the slides up there maybe sooner than that. And, uh, of course, you can download the full report uh, and the um, appendices and look at the database because you have the links and all of this stuff. Until March 7th, please don't post this anywhere where people can, where Google can find it. After March 7th, post it anywhere Google can find it. it would be great. Thank you very much for attending, and uh, I'm sure I'll be communicating with some of you in the future. Thank you.